Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brandon Darby, and um, I like to I like to hear Anita speak. We've been on a tour, and I think we've hit nine or ten or eleven places, and shared our stories and varying levels. Um, today it's a it's a lunch meeting, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a lot. And tonight in Daytona, how many of you can go to Daytona tonight? Any of you? One of you? At least one of you? Peggy? Anyone? <laughs> Peggy's going. That's great. Um, tonight in Daytona, I'll probably give a fuller account. You know, usually I can actually talk for about two hours if um, and um, and get through everything. But I'm going to spare you that today. You know. I work for Breitbart.com. I, I worked for Andrew um, before he passed away, and now I work for his best friend and for Steve Bannon, who run the site, Breitbart. And <clears throat> my experiences meeting Andrew and the things I had gone through in my life and the things I, that he encouraged me to do and the things I've done since, of, I guess they're a little unique, and I guess that's why <clears throat> I travel so much. I, I'm usually home about maybe three or four days a month. You know, and um, it gets a little tiring sometimes of traveling, but then it always makes up for it when I'm sitting up here and I'm talking to you people. Because, see, <clears throat> in America, we, we have this thing that's very American. We believe in redemption. And only in this country could someone like me who worked with Black Panthers end up in this situation, you know, with so many people who smile at me and conservative, patriotic, pro-American groups of people. Only in America could someone like me who used to support radical Palestinians, and I did, you know, end up in a situation where I'm a pretty big advocate for Israel now. And I, I've done all that I could possibly do. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I tell you, I, I put a lot of effort out. Um, I, I didn't commit any serious crimes or anything. I mean, I go fast sometimes, I drive fast and whatever, but, um, I didn't commit any major crimes. I didn't, I didn't get in trouble. I didn't anything. But I, I definitely associated with people on the far left. And I did a lot of things that I think helped people. But at the same time, I, I supported a lot of things that I'm not proud of, you know. And I worked with a lot of people I'm not proud that I worked with. And so I ended up in a situation where I felt I, I went through a number of experiences that led me to actually really appreciate our system. I wasn't raised politically or with a political ideology, or, but I ended up really appreciating our system. And when you hear the whole story, it actually makes sense why. But I began to feel ashamed and I began to feel like not only did I need to get away from the far left, but I actually needed to do something to, to stop them, you know, to challenge them. Um, and I began to reach out to them, trying to get them to change and realized that the far left was insane and that the moderate left was supporting them. And when that didn't work, um, I decided I would be a little more intense about it and I ended up working with the FBI and I ended up putting a bunch of those people in jail. And um, well, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And um, then I decided, you know, like, well, I'm, if anyone follows me on Twitter, I'm brutal. Like I, Andrew actually started my Twitter account for me. And I, I kind of model what, he's, what, he what he did. I try to. I'm not as smart as Andrew. I'm not as, he, I mean, he's a lot quicker than I was, for sure, um, than I am. But people say, well, you're not going to reach out to many leftists with that. And I said, my point isn't to reach out to them. My point is to reach out to you and to show you like, how important it is to pay attention to them and talk back and to stand up, talk back, and not shut up. Because that whole concept of ignoring ignoring the far left. Remember how we used to do that? We used to be like, oh, ignore those crazies. No one's listening to them. Well, it didn't work out too good, did it? No, it really didn't. Turns out a lot of people were listening to them because they have a very deceptively, it's a seductive narrative, isn't it? It really is. Maybe not to you, but it is to a lot of people who, who maybe don't have the best political analysis and they don't recognize the importance of, of a system that actually has existed for several hundred years with a checks and balances that don't work perfectly, but they work, you know? We have a stable, wonderful system. And that n narrative is very seductive, and that narrative 
is simply this. The narrative is that if you want to care about other people, you vote left. And if you want to help rich, white, racist people be selfish, you vote right. If you want to protect the planet, you vote left. If you want to help people pollute with coal plants, you vote right. That's the narrative. And that narrative is very powerful in our society. And even though we're a center-right nation, which I'm not really sure what that means, but I, I think I get a gist of that. Even though we're, we're a, a right-of-center nation, right? Um, and most Americans would identify as conservative. The issue is, is that our media, our music, our Hollywood, our movies, none of that is, is conservative at all. And they, they, they spin a very, very clever and seductive narrative. And you know, I, I had been a runaway when I was 13 and 14. And I stayed gone most of that time. And I had some, you know, I, mean, that's, I could actually talk about that, but I'm not going to. But it, was, it wasn't the best situation I put myself into um, with issues that happened in my home and me leaving. And, and the thing was, though, is, is I ended up about, in, when I was 15, I ended up living with a grandparent. And I was actually OK. You know, I mean, I had some issues from what I had gone through. And, and I didn't feel like I fit in with all the other kids in school when they were able to get me back into a school because I didn't. I just quit going and ran away. Um, I felt a little strange because most of the 15-year-olds around me didn't have the experiences I had, so I always felt a little different. Um, but one of the things that, it's kind of like if you were in a plane crash, right, and you were the only survivor, you would feel like, you, like why did I survive? Like, what am I supposed to do? And I always kind of had that feeling. And because a lot of the people that were runaways, they didn't end up OK. They ended up with, with AIDS, or they ended up on drugs or they ended up incarcerated, or they ended up dead, and I didn't, you know? And I still sit here without much, I guess, I mean, I guess it, I, I accomplish good things I'm proud of in a different way, but I have a GED, you know? The last year I actually completed in school was eighth grade, and um, I, don't, I didn't go to college, so, I, I mean, I, you know, but I still think I came out pretty well considering, and especially in comparison with the other people. So I've always felt this massive like, desire to be helpful and to help those that no one else wanted to help. And that got me associated with people in nonprofits and doing really radical things that helped people, which got me to be associated with Black Panthers, former Black Panthers, and, and really prominent environmental activists and organizers. And they saw my energy. And what they often do is they find young people with a lot of passion and energy. They take them in. And then they begin. They say, read a people's history of the United States. You know, here's, look at this version of history. Look what this government has done. Look at this oppression you see in the world. And this system is based upon oppression. It's based upon competition. It's descendant from a European you know, need to hoard things for winters. And the world isn't that way anymore. And so why are we still hoarding for ourselves when there's enough to share and da, da, da. And the next thing you know, you find yourself having a real issue, like half of our country does, with the economic system of the United States of America. You, think, you find yourself thinking competition is somehow a bad thing. And that's what happened in my life. So I was a pretty radical activist. I, at the time, I thought I was leftist. And it all got really strange for me when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Remember that? And so I went to New Orleans, and myself and a couple of former Black Panthers who are quite famous on the left and receive a lot of mainstream support, even though they defend cop killers. That's a whole other story. Um, they, myself, and an environmental activist who's very prominent, we co-founded a relief organization. Now, initially, we were very radical. Um, but what happened with me was I was put in a position of leadership where I was the organizer and I was running the operation for the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, which was the hardest hit area from Hurricane Katrina, the lower and, ninth, and upper Ninth Ward. And the experiences I had there, I began to realize very quickly that one for one, like the residents, the black residents, didn't buy into the radical ideologies of the people who are supposedly their leaders. They didn't. And I began to realize that there were a lot of black leaders in the community who stood up to help their people when, for the three or four months after Katrina, before ACORN came back, right, 
and all the other groups started to show back up, I began to realize that those people were leaders, but they didn't get any of the nonprofit money or the governmental money. The people who got the money were the so-called self-appointed black leaders who really only had white liberals and white academics standing behind them. That's all they had. They didn't have, like, they didn't have the average black resident looking to them as a leader, but yet they got all the money, and then I started to feel like they didn't do anything with the money. They didn't do anything that actually helped. They only did things that seemed to perpetuate the need. And I had a problem with that, and, you know, and then I, I began to defend the private property rights of the Ninth Ward owners. My leaders like Medea Benjamin and Michael Moore and the other people who were funding us came in and said, Brandon, chill on that private property rights talk. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we don't support that. I'm like, I support private property rights. And so what I began to realize was I was not such a leftist after all. I had falsely thought that helping, my desire to help meant that I was left of center. But really the politics and the attitudes of the left of center, I didn't embrace. You know, when I was working in the Ninth Ward and people would say, well, Brandon, don't you think that a, a young black woman should lead this organization and not you, you're a white male? And I would say, well, I actually don't think so because I don't know anyone who's willing to come live on the wood floor with me, you know? and get staph infections and all the other things that happen when you're in a swamp area that's been under 20 feet of water that hasn't had electricity or running water for three or four months, you know? And so I began to realize that there was a, a, a big difference between what actually was happening in reality and what was being thought of or what sounded good in the halls of academia. And long story short, I mean, I could get into this boring tangent about my trip to Venezuela when Hugo Chavez invited us. And, and I mean, I could go on and on. There's some crazy stuff, but I won't today. What I'll tell you is that I ended up leaving the city of New Orleans with a very real education from experience. And you know that thing that now academia calls, they call it um, authoritative knowledge, you know, which they, we used to call it uh, all book smarts, no sense and they somehow reframed it into authoritative knowledge as though my experiential knowledge is not, a, you know, my, my life experience is not on par with their authoritative knowledge or whatever. But anyways, I, I left there realizing there was a big difference between the philosophies that I had thought were, were logical and the philosophies that academics think up and what actually happens on the ground, what actually happens in real life. And I left there a very appreciative of a friend I had made who was named Captain John Bryson, who was a law enforcement officer, because he had helped me start shelters. He had really helped me do a lot. And what was interesting about that is when he and I worked together to help people, the dehumanization that the leftist ideologies depend upon, like the reason no one wants to work with you on the left or in black communities traditionally, for the most part, is because it's not because your argument, your pro-liberty argument that says we can help people better than a federal government can, that argument is a very good argument, but that's why the left needs to call you a racist and needs to dehumanize you and needs to call like police officers pigs and needs to call soldiers baby killers. And why they, that's why they have to have that dehumanization because your argument is a better argument and they know it. So I left there with the dehumanization of patriotic people, cops and military people and and people who felt differently than me, I left there with that dehumanization no longer present. I left there with a very strong disdain. I still wouldn't have called myself a conservative, but I definitely was becoming very anti-left. And what was interesting is I went back to Texas. I stayed like two years or so in New Orleans, two and a half years. I went back to Texas. I got a small piece of property with a little house. And which I was only able to get because someone was getting it foreclosed on and sold it to me for what they owed. And I bought some chickens and two goats and two pigs and a dog. And I just began to you know, plant a garden, learn how to jar things and learn how to, you know, just learn how to live and be normal and get back to a normal life that wasn't so crazy as what I had experienced in New Orleans and in Venezuela and what have you. And one of the things that was weird was that even though I was trying to leave the left, the left didn't want to leave me. And what I mean by that is that the far left leaders I had grown so close to would come to me and they would still share with me the things that they were doing, which was interesting. And I would say, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And they would say, well, you went back to your white privilege, Brandon. And I would say, well, I don't know about that. And they're like, you'll come back around to the movement eventually. I said, you're just burnt out right now. Well, one of the people 
who had um, who had approached me, right? He uh, and was a friend of mine at, at one point. Was a man named Riyadh Hamad, and Riyadh Hamad was he ran the largest. I'm trying not to do this. Oh, I did it. Dang it. Okay, y'all all saw me spill this water on my lap, right? <laughs> all of you saw this. Every one of you saw this. So I'm just saying, just just keep that in mind when I get up and walk off. <laughs> <laughs> So Riyadh Hamad approached me, and he ran the largest Palestinian nonprofit called the Palestinian Children's Welfare Fund. But do you know at this point, I had begun to question not only the things I had thought I believed, but I began to question everything that my elders and mentors had taught me, because I began to realize that their version of history was skewed with a desire to engage in dehumanization, right, of, of other thought. And so my views on the Palestinian and Israel conflict had changed substantially. I began to see them as a very important ally in a world full of very evil people, you know, very evil systems. And um, he approached me, and he, he had skimmed off between two and $500,000 that he wanted to send underground, you know, secretly to that region. And I was like, well, now, Riyadh, you, you send so much money every year to Palestine. Why, why do you need to do that? And he began to talk about the things that could be done with suicide bombings and do 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 And I began to get the impression that he wanted to kill little Israeli children. And I said, well, you know, I'm not cool with this. And then I thought, well, what do I do? And see, for you, you'd say, well, I'll turn this person in. But for me, it actually took a little bit because as a far leftist, like, you do not talk to the FBI ever. There's nothing that they hate more than the FBI nothing, right? They blame the FBI for destroying the Panthers, destroying their revolution, stopping their revolution in the 60s and 70s, and they're right. The FBI did partly do those things, you know? Um, I now know that the Panthers actually destroyed themselves, actually, but I think that the FBI played a part. Well, anyways, you do not talk to the FBI. And then my mother's pastor sent me this email, and the email had a link in it. And I clicked on the link, and it was a first responders video from Israel. And so it was the people who went in first to the areas where suicide bombs had gone off. And all it took was me seeing a toddler's arm to go, you know, I'm going to turn this dude in. And, you know, I, I called John Bryce, and remember the police officer who I, I really appreciated from New Orleans? And I told him what was going on, and, and he was like, yeah, you need to talk to the FBI. And I said, I really don't feel safe with that. I'm pretty sure they don't like me. He goes, I'm pretty sure they don't like you too. <laughs> and he goes, but remember so-and-so? I was like, yeah, she was a nice lady. How's she doing? And he said, well, her son is an FBI agent. I'm like, whoa, I, we, we gutted her home, and we helped her get her home fit. He's like, yeah, you helped her's mom. He'll be all right with you. I said, okay. So I met with him. Well, long story short, Riyadh Hamad gets his house raided and his place is raided. Turns out what I said was true. And Riyadh Hamad goes missing. And then a few days later, um, the news comes on and says a Palestinian man wanted by the FBI was found bound and gagged in the middle of Town Lake in Austin, Texas. And I was like, well, that can't be good. <laughs> and so I didn't really know if it was the Palestinians he worked with who knew he was in trouble and didn't want him to talk or if it was... And at that point, I didn't know. I know now I, don't, I really don't believe the FBI beats people and kills them and throws them in lakes. But at that time, I didn't know because I was still coming off that left of center trip I had been on for so many years. And it turns out that Mr. Hamad, who was a big-time Christian and worked with all these churches, was actually a Muslim. And then his secret imam... Once he died, they just came out and said he was a Muslim and acted like they had never said he was a Christian, which is fine that he's a Muslim, whatever. But what was interesting about it is Mr. Hamad, rather than face the consequences for what he had been a part of, he decided to kill himself, and he decided to do it in a way that made it look like the Mossad or the FBI did it. And a final middle finger to the U.S. government, right, and to Israel. But Mr. Hamad did not realize that there was a traffic surveillance camera far away that picked up Mr. Hamad getting out and wrapping his face up and jumping in the lake. And um, to this day, though, the left still calls me a joint Mossad FBI hitman. You know, which is not, it's kind of cool sounding to me. I, you know, I don't know about your politics, but to me, I don't mind that. And considering that they're trying to get people to hurt me all the time, that doesn't help their cause of getting people to feel comfortable to attack me, you know? 
like people generally want to stay away from me because they think I'm a hitman or something. And, um, and I'm not. I guess if I was, I wouldn't tell you I was. So just keep that in mind. I'm just saying. Keep that in mind and the water you saw me spill on my lap. Okay, so here's the deal. So that somehow went on and on. I couldn't talk to anyone. Obviously, I had nightmares over it. It was horrible. And I did, it was, I'm, not, I'm not geared or trained to deal with people jumping in lakes with duct tape on their face who I had been friends with for years. Um, it messed me up a while, but now I'm at a point where I kind of realize that there are probably little, you know, at this point, they would be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old Israelis who are alive because that man is not alive. And I'm okay with that. So I couldn't talk to anyone else about it and, and not wrong. I felt like I'd be wrong in my country, the country that I felt like I owed a lot to at this point. And the only people I could talk to were FBI agents, right? So I'd call them and be like, man, I'm really having a hard time with this. I really can't sleep. And they'd be like, well, it's okay. And we'd talk and talk. And the next thing you know, I was like, you know, there's a couple of other crazy things going on you should know about, too. And they're like, like what? And I said, let me tell you. So I started talking and talking and talking. And then at some point, I began to learn a lot about how they actually did operate. And then they said, you know, Brandon, you've had these experiences in life. You don't get scared in this and that. You can handle this and that. And you, you seem to be blah, 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 blah. And we, we have a pretty trusting relationship at this point, and you know this and that, and your reputation from the past, you have access to this and that, and people don't doubt that you think that you're a cop, and da 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 da. And they're like, why don't you help us? And I was like, what does that look like? And they explained the whole informant thing, you know, like y'all, you guys say, the left calls them snitches, you call them informants. Um, they explained to me that there's, you know, the different levels of inf human sources and yada yada. And they said, why don't you be an operational source and help us infiltrate groups and da da. And so for the next two years, I had a really wild life, you know. <laughs> and that culminated into this situation where they said, hey, would you do us a favor? And I'm like, what's that, man? And they're like, would you go to this meeting? And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, it's these, these anarchists, and they're planning to, we have reports that they're planning to shut down the Republican National Convention by any means necessary. Would you go check it out and tell us if that's what's going on? And I said, yeah, I'll go, man. Give me the info. They gave me the info. I went. And lo and behold, that's what exactly what was happening. But what was really weird about it was that a lot of the people organizing it, right, the big fish on the left, were my former mentors. And I was like, well, that's interesting, because I knew what they were all about at that point very well. And I began to realize that this group of 500 to 1,000 people who was going to, now keep this in mind, when you say shut down the RNC by any means necessary, what that means is interfere with your constitutionally guaranteed right to assemble with the threat of violence. That's what that means. That's a big deal. That's a huge, huge deal in this country for that kind of thing to be occurring. But see, what I realized was that this group, right, they, the tongue-in-cheek na name was the RNC Welcoming Committee. Now, this group, who was traveling around the country showing videos of people throwing Molotov cocktails, handing out maps with corporate targets in the homes of executives and RNC chairs and all that stuff, and all, these people they were being trained and predominantly led by a woman named Lisa Fithian. Now, this is what's significant. How many of you know of Cindy Sheehan? Okay, well, her, her strategist was Lisa Fithian. How many of you remember when, in 1999, when Seattle was shut down? A few of you? By the unions? Okay, the organizer for that is Lisa Fithian. How many of you have ever heard of the SCIU? Okay, their lead organizer, their lead paid organizer for protesting is Lisa Fithian. Now, this is where it gets tricky. How many of you have ever heard of Code Pink and United for Peace and Justice? Okay, their steering committee has Lisa Fithian, right? So Lisa Fithian, who's organizing the 10,000 mainstream liberal protest of the Republican National Convention, which, God bless them, that's their right to do, right, to protest, Lisa Fithian's also organizing the RNC Welcoming Committee. Same people. 
Now, here's what's interesting about it, is these groups, and this is the most significant thing I can tell you today. These groups decided that the way they were going to do it was they were going to have red, yellow, and green groups, okay? They made a map. They looked at all the roads that the buses of delegates could possibly take to get to the, cent the, the, the convention center to, to pick Sarah Palin and John McCain. I wish it had been Sarah Palin and John McCain, not Palin and John McCain, but and Sarah Palin. But I like Sarah Palin a lot. I really do. But here's the deal. So they decide that they're going to have this one group. They're going to call them the yellow group. They're the ones who are going to get arrested. They're going to get in all the roads. They're going to put their arms in PVC pipes and handcuff themselves together. And they're going to do that across the road so the cops can't cut them out. And if the cops do, it's going to cut them. And then they'll have the victory of saying the cops injured peaceful, nonviolent protesters and cut them and what have you. And they decided that that yellow group who was going to do that would not be able to do that because the police would stop them before they could, right? Here's the catch. So they decided what they were going to do was have the green group, which is the average liberal protesting who doesn't realize they're being used to, do, to cover for illegal activity. They were going to have the majority of protesters, the green group, go into the road. They were going to, come on, let's go out here and protest, get them in the roads. And then the police were going to say, get out of the road, so the green group would get out of the road, because they're not going to violate a lawful order. They're just the average liberals who don't do anything creepy or illegal, and they think they're just protesting evilness and racism in the world, right? And they were going to try to slow down that green group from leaving. And then if that green group, going in the road and then getting out of the road, didn't, unintent or didn't inadvertently go ahead and give the yellow group the cover they needed to lock down, then they were going to have the red group, the black mask wearing anarchists, like go in and actually throw things at the cops, fight the cops, hurt the cops, throw Molotovs at the cops, and then flee. So that would hopefully give the yellow group time to lock down. Now, when the cops reacted, which they would inevitably do on the protesters because people in the protest are doing that, then they would say, well, that was another group, and then the cops attacked the peaceful demonstrators for no reason. And then the average peaceful demonstrator in the green group would actually think they had been attacked by the cop for no reason because they don't realize what else is going on. That is a significant little microcosm, a little example of what left of center is. That is how they operate in this country. That is the average liberal not realizing what they're a part of. That little example well, it's something you should sear into your minds because that is what is going on in this country right now with the Democratic Party. That is what is happening. So this thing spawns bomb plots, right? I end up testifying in a bomb plot. Most of the guys pled guilty. There was actually three bomb plots where they made Molotovs, but this one in particular, these two guys made eight gallon-sized homemade napalm mixtured bombs to throw out Republican delegates and cops, and it was supposed to be like the vanguard moment where they did it, and that would just break the ice, and then everyone would start making them and throwing them at cops and delegates and really take this war home kind of thing. And the FBI stops them. Um, I'm the person who was the, the undercover in the deal, so I have to testify. And I decided I would testify. I didn't want to, but I probably should testify. I figured, so I did. And one of them pled guilty. The other guy decides to fight it. And he decides to come up with the false narrative that the FBI and I made the bombs and planted them to justify Bush's counterterrorism budget. And do you know that that sounds absurd, but do you know it didn't to the New York Times? <laughs> and do you know that when a little more information came out, you know? Because I'm going to go back here. I had done some... some pretty wild things to help people in New Orleans. And do you know out of 23,000 volunteers that came through our organization, right, there was not one bad thing said about me on the internet. There was some people who thought bad things because they didn't like the, the fact that I was obviously embracing some right of center policies. Or, but there was nothing bad written about me. The New Orleans Times Picayune had stories about the shelters I started with John Bryson and yada, yada, you know, all these fluffy things. And when my identity came out as having helped the FBI, the Times Picayune scrubbed those stories and began to attack me and talk about my shadowy role in the city of New Orleans. And then the defense team didn't do it, but all the anarchists who are friends with the lawyer decided that they would put up posters in every place I ever lived or worked 
And they would say, unless people come forward showing that Brandon Darby tries to get people to blow things up and is evil and violent and da da da, then these two innocent kids are going to go to jail for life, you know? Which wasn't true. They're, a, they weren't kids. A, they weren't innocent. And they weren't going to get life. Um, but they ended up going to prison. That's fine. But here's the deal. So they began a campaign of character assassination. On the news, when they showed the pictures of these bomb-making men, they didn't show pictures of bomb-making men. They showed pictures of the kids who the FBI arrested under dubious circumstances. And they were pictures of them at 10 and 12 and 15. And they looked so innocent, you know? And I didn't really like that. And exactly like Trayvon Martin, exactly. It's called, here's the deal, you learned something. You learned something. And, and you're probably starting to pick this up. You probably caught on when they started calling you racist and you knew you weren't racist. But there's these things I call indicators of deception. And when I see indicators of deception, that indicates to me that there's something else going on. When someone says, Mamiya Abu Jamal didn't kill that racist pig, I say, there is an indicator of deception, you know? <laughs> Like, there's an indicator of deception because you had to dirty the name of the victim in order to make your, you know, there's all these indicators of deception. And when I saw that Trayvon thing, man, and I know that some people are going to be like, those are, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not saying my opinion, I'm just telling you, there were indicators of deception with the choice of pictures they chose to use. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. Okay, so, I'm not, this isn't a Trayvon talk. I'm going to get off the Trayvon thing. But what I'm going to tell you is, I began to get dirtied so badly that the, the organization I had co-founded, I was no longer a co-founder. I was just a guy who was nominally involved and who volunteered. I mean, these people went far. They went real far. And it wasn't until later that I actually got my co-founder status back, and now I was a co-founder. I'm not a co I was a co-founder. I'm an FBI informant who was a co-founder of a relief organization, you know, who's also a womanizer who beats people and carries pistols and gun totes and sleeps with a gun by my bed and da, 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 all these evil things. I actually do sleep with a gun by my bed, but you would too if you were me. <laughs> and, um, and that's what I told Mother Jones when Mother Jones was attacking me. And like, is it true you sleep with a gun under your pillow? And I was like, I do not. It's by my bed. It's on my nightstand. <laughs> you know, and the other one's under my mattress and the other one's like, what? And, and they didn't, they, anyways, whatever, it doesn't matter. So I began to get attacked. These guys had this false narrative that I and the FBI made and planted the bombs. And then the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office releases a little information that shows that that's not true. And I went to bed that night, and I thought, I'm vindicated, right? But do you know, I woke up the next morning, and they just had a completely different narrative. The guy just changed his story and said, um, my mind was controlled by the FBI, and they, 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 like, they controlled my mind and beat me down and then, and then made me make these bombs. And I thought that sounded ridiculous, but do you know, the New York Times didn't. <laughs> and neither did any of the left media and the HuffPo, and the, every, every left establishment that could attack the absolute heck out of me with that second false narrative. And I would say, well, how can you believe this guy? He just said a whole different thing, and you followed that, and then it tr tr turns out to be a lie, and then you just like, change the story and act like you weren't wrong the first time. How can you do that? And the FBI said, Brandon, just calm down. We've got to testify. Don't worry. And I'm like, I don't like sitting here letting this false narrative build. I want to challenge it. And they're like, you got to stop. We're going to test. I said, okay, okay. And they released a little information about a week later. And it shows that, indeed, these guys made the bombs and that we didn't control their minds, right? Well, so <clears throat> I went to bed that night, and I was like, oh, finally I'm vindicated. And I woke up the next day, and they had a whole nother story, a completely third separate story, and it was that I gave them the idea to make the Molotov cocktails. And, you know, that sounds silly, but the New York Times didn't think so. And neither did anyone else on the left media, because at that point, conservatives didn't, conservative media never covered it, because they didn't know to pay attention to the crazies, right? They didn't know. They're like, well, there's a trial going on. We'll let it sort out, and then we'll talk about it. And so no one, Fox never mentioned it, you know, but all the left did was attacking the heck out of me. So I said, and the men and women I served with. And so we go to trial, and it turns out the Holder Justice Department at that point decided to only allot enough resources for four and a half hours of the 210 hours of recorded phone calls um, to be 
transcribed, and therefore that's all that could be admitted as evidence. And so they were able to get some jurors to go, we don't, I mean, it's possible the informant gave, you know, this, this informant with a shadowy history now, it's like, thanks, you know, gave, gave the, the idea to these guys. It's possible, and guess what? If it's possible, guess what you get? You get, it's a hung jury is what you get. You don't get off because most people aren't idiots in our country, but some people were. And it was possible based on what the evidence was. And so now the left media really went crazy with the narrative, the entrap entrapping informant of the FBI, right? And then they started singling me out, and I was just this evil person. And so we had to wait, and the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office said, hey, man, we really want to file these charges again. We want to go back at it. And I was like, uh, I don't really feel like it, but I probably should. So I decided to testify again. But that time, the FBI, on their own volition, assigned 35 agents to go through the 210 hours of recorded phone calls and the, all the evidence they needed the whole time, that million-dollar trial, right? They got wasted your taxpayer dollars. Like, all the evidence they needed the whole time was right there. The guy talking on it with his girlfriend on the phone going, yeah, well, I'm going to say this. And do it. the whole thing was there. All of it was there. So the guy, we go to trial, and the guy's like, he realizes what against him, and he pleads guilty, admits he made it all up. He gets two extra years for lying, right? The judge got on him for it, for ruining my life with his lies. And I felt vindicated. And do you know that I went to bed, <laughs> and I woke up, and the next narrative was that my performance of hypermasculinity made it inevitable that young men in my presence would want to make bombs to kill evil cops and Republicans. <laughs> and it's not that specific. What they say is that I, um, I, I basically, my aggressive behavior, right, my macho attitude, my radical past and views made it inevitable that it would drum up the emotions in these young kids who looked up to me. These guys didn't like me. You know, they didn't like me at all. But it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter. And so that was the narrative. And you know what? The New York Times believed it. And then George Soros and PBS decided to pitch in some money and make a movie attacking me. Called Better This World, the story of two childhood friends who set out to better their world before they met the FBI informant, Brandon Darby. And do you know that that's not a lot of fun? And the New York Times decided to go and say, well, maybe, maybe Darby didn't entrap them, but he definitely encouraged the bomb plot. And I said, you're going to retract that. And they're like, no, we're not. And I filed a lawsuit, and then 30 days later, they retracted it. And I'm still suing them to this day. And it's in the appellate court. I mean, it's a big mess, man. It really is. Like, you wouldn't believe. They can just say whatever they want about you. And then they print a little retraction on the back page. No matter that 270-something other like, newspaper outlets covered that and said that about you. And they don't repeat in, in, retractions. You know, they don't. They, it's not right. So I fought back, and about that time, Andrew Breitbart heard me on NPR when NPR was attacking me on a series they called Turncoats, you know? <laughs> you think I'm joking. I'm not. And um, he called me and said, thank you. And I said, uh, you're welcome. Who are you? And he's like, well, I'm Andrew Breitbart. And I said, oh, hey, man. And he said, well, why don't you fight back? I said, I do fight back. I really do. They just don't print what I say. They don't print the points I make. They don't print my arguments, Andrew. And he said, well, you can write on my sites, and you can say whatever you have to say, and I'm not going to censor you, and I don't care what your politics are, and I don't care. And do you know that over time and over the years, like working with conservatives and that dehumanization breaking down and realizing slowly, as I still to this day realize, like I actually thought Sarah Palin was an idiot at one point because of that whole thing with the magazines. And the, well, then I watched this film by Steve Bannon, you know, about Sarah Palin, and I realized that she wasn't an idiot at all and that I had been duped. And I'm still to this day realizing that things I thought were true, like I just realized yesterday that Alberto Gonzalez wasn't politically going through a political witch hunt in the DOJ and he was actually kicking out radicals who Clinton had put in. I didn't know that until yesterday. <laughs> and I'm to this day, to this day realizing how duped I had been. You know, thanks to Andrew not being someone, because he defended me, because when I first came around several years ago, I was very pro-choice still. Some of you might be, that's your business, but I'm, a, I'm not, you know? But I was, but I had never questioned it, because I was raised, or my, 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 you just don't question Planned Parenthood. And then I read about Margaret Sanger, and I was like, eee, you know? I was like, that's creepy, 
You know, this, she wanted to do what? And now they're doing what? Ooh, not good. And then I read about Walter Durante. You know, read about Walter Durante. Read about him. He was a New York Times bureau chief. And he, like, hid and covered and spun for Stalin to hide the, the, the pogroms and hide, the, hide the, uh, the purges that they did where 20 million people died. Remember that? Well, the New York Times kind of hid that for a decade and got caught on it. Kind of a big scandal at the time. And um, still is in my mind. But I began to learn these things and move along. But that's because he didn't demand purity from me. He just saw that I was on the path to see the light. And he welcomed me in. Welcomed me in. And so um, I hope that my story helps a little bit in you understanding what you're dealing with. Because what you're dealing with is the average liberal you're dealing with, they're pretty nice people in my opinion. They just buy into a false narrative. But the people behind the left, the people who are behind it, the organizers, the leaders, they know exactly what they're doing. And that dehumanization, you have to break it down because it's been very successful because you've ignored it for a long time. You, you have to break it down. On a final note, I'm going to tell you, there's a film coming out that happens to be one of Andrew's last projects. Anybody know when I say Andrew? I'm talking about Andrew Breitbart, right? We know Andrew. Um, what's that? No, that's a good film, too, 2016. But this film is called Occupy Unmasked. And it's a Stephen Bannon film. And I get this. This is like a real big slap to the left. It's a Citizens United, Steve Bannon, Andrew Breitbart, Brandon Darby, Anita Moncrief film. And it's coming out real soon. And it's about the Occupy movement and who's behind it. I strongly suggest you watch it, people. Um, hey, thank you. Thank you for having me.